was teaching a class at college which was entitled Introduction to the Novel, and I never in my wildest dreams imagined that Mark would be, I don't mean Mark specifically, but any of my students would let me go on and to um, actually write a novel himself, which was, was uh, published by a very prestigious New York house, which was called The Dog, Catch, Dog Fighter, which is set in Mexico and is concerned with the... Can you hear me? Oh, sorry. And, and it's concerned with the um, a protagonist who is um, making his living, when not in construction, fighting dogs for a living, which is a kind of very gruesome thing. I've read the novel myself and thought it was absolutely wonderful. So I'm, I'm delighted that we actually have a novelist talking today to us about uh, novels. Mark graduated from Santa Rosa Junior College and then went on to University of California at Berkeley. And then he moved to New York City and did an MFA in creative writing. I'm going to shut up now because I want Mark to have the maximum amount of time. And I'm just going to pin my ears back and I'm sure we're all going to learn a great deal. Mark. Thank you, Bob. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Is that too loud? No? Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the fourth and final presentation of the Santa Rosa Junior College English Department WOLM series. As Bob mentioned, my name is Mark Wojnowski and I'm going to be speaking to you today about the concept or the idea of setting and setting as an element of fiction in Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five, Vonnegut's use of setting. Uh, but before I begin, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank not only the English Department and the Wool Committee, but Janet McCulloch in particular. I don't see her for the opportunity to be here today. It's rare that we're given the opportunity, thank you, it's rare that we're given the opportunity to come together as a community to discuss a work of literary merit. And so this is special. And I appreciate and, and, and I am honored and, and I take great pride in being able to be here today to sweat underneath these lights and run at the mouth while some of you fall asleep in the back. Uh, also, I'd like to apologize in advance for all the swearing, but I find it necessary and effective in capturing some of the uh, younger and shorter attention spans. With that said, there we go. The California essayist and novelist Joan Didion once wrote that we tell story in order to survive. Let me get out of the light. We tell story in order to live. Now, I, I encountered this sentence a very long time, well, not that very long ago, a number of years ago, and I've been thinking about it ever since. And, well, I've been wondering, what the hell does she mean? Does she mean by this that we need stories to be able to live, that somehow stories will actually keep us alive? Or is she saying something else, that maybe stories will, in fact, enrich our lives? Is she speaking metaphorically? Um, so again, that's just what I said, so I probably should have moved the slide. Do stories keep us alive or do they enable us to live our lives more fully? Well, the conclusion that I came to, and one that, that I come with, to with most complicated issues, is that it, it generally depends upon the story. So how about this one? Jack drank from the well and died. Now, if you were to walk into a space and there were to be a well right over there and someone was dead on the floor next to it, and someone else was sitting there and you said, what happened? And the person said, well, Jack drank from the well and died. You then will have learned from this story, you, this is vital, note, vital information, that you would survive using that information. But is that what she meant? Possibly. But how about another story? When Jack went to the well to drink, he became transfixed by his own reflection on the surface of the water, and he stared into it and stared into it, and he continued to stare into it, forsaking everything else until he died of dehydration. Now, is there a literal meaning to this, or is this more of a figurative language, or metaphorical? Are we to understand that this is indeed any meaningful information? Some of you may have heard this story with a different character's name. Um, but there's something about this information, and there's something that I think that we can learn from it. So with both of those, yes, I think that she meant both that stories will help us survive, literally, but they help us live. Now, either way, Jack dies. Because ultimately, we all do. I mean, it's, it's nice to see all of, you, all of you here today. But unfortunately, we're not all going to be here for very long. Um, well, I hope we're here for quite a while. Um, but again, so 
telling stories has, it plays an integral role, role, role in our lives. And that it, sorry, it helps us better articulate what we like to call the human condition. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the term the human condition, uh, it's, it's something that we use to describe the meaning or, or, or the meanings of life. Um, it's also how we talk about isolation, whether or not being alone someplace or, or suffering from, from loneliness, whether or not you're even sitting in a crowd and here feeling fairly lonely. It's about feeling isolated inside of your own mind. But it's also about how we contemplate and, and talk about happiness and whether or not we can find happiness or whether or not happiness can be achieved. And it's how we deal with or talk about the inevitability of death. But stories help us articulate, but not only that, they, they help us explore the human condition. They help us explore these things. Now, how? Well, certain people take the time out of their daily lives to sit down, usually sitting down, uh, in darkened rooms, and they spend a significant amount of time thinking about how they can tell different stories and what these stories are trying to say and what they're trying to do. Kurt Vonnegut was one of these people, and we're lucky to have had him. Um, but it, it's not that it's easy. I'm not trying to say that it's easy. But there's certain tricks of the trade, and there's certain things that you can use to your advantage that folks have been using for a very, very long time. And we like to call these the elements of fiction. Now, some of you may have heard about the elements of fiction from when you were in high school, or maybe you've been learning about them in 1A or 100. Um, but what they are, the, the three that I'd like to discuss for right now are character. Well, the first one would be character. And there's been a, a kind of a long-standing debate as to which of these are hierarchically the most important. Um, as far as I'm concerned, in the English language, because we begin most of our sentences with subjects, with characters, that character is right up there. It's certainly very important. Character is the subject of a story or the subject of a sentence, the who or the what. But and you can see down here at the bottom, for those of you, I don't know if you're 302, 100, 305, underline once. But there's also the story. There's the plot. There's the action. There's the how and the why. If you notice under here, we have, we have Jack, right, our subject. And what did he do? He drank and he died. Notice those are in the past tense. So not only are we able to deal with, with a subject, but we're able to deal with time. But what about space, time and space? Well, that's where this one comes in, setting. Now, setting, it's usually the argument is, is which is more important, character or story, or story or character, and, and what am I going to begin my story with? Which, you know, I, I have to decide. And I think that this one gets left in the dust a little too often because it's essential. I mean, if you look at this sentence, Jack drank from the well and died. This bit of information, which, as we know, we put in parentheticals so we can cross it out, and our subject won't be there, right? This bit of information, this prepositional phrase, helps, or, or, help us, or, helps us arrange ourselves in, in space and in time. So the setting, in my opinion, is very important. Now, some of you have read the book, some of you have not read the book. But in the book, there is a city called Dresden. And this city undergoes a significant transformation, to put it lightly. Uh, but it is, in many ways, an ideal setting. And if you look at this word ideal, it's a noun, you look at it as a conception, an idea, of something in its perfection. But look at where that appears. It's in your imagination. Now, Dresden was a sort of, of Eden. It was the culture, it was the, the, the sort of the soul of Germany. It was the cultural center, it was where art and music and architecture in particular, you know, it, was, it was the soul of Germany. Uh, but we need to be able to reference it back to something. And one of, arguably one of the most famous settings of all time, in the Western canon at least, is the, the, the Garden of Eden. Now, now, for those of you who don't know the story, uh, a very long time ago, don't, don't, don't say forever because that's just exaggerating, uh, a, a very long time ago, uh, a character named God created the heavens and the earth. And he created humankind, and he said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it, which is fine. But then a couple sentences later, there's another story. And in, in this story, God creates the heaven and the earth, and he creates a garden. 
And at the center of this garden, he puts a tree of life and then the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And this garden is beautiful, right? I mean, Sonoma County is beautiful, but this garden is beautiful. And he has no one to tend it, though. And so he reaches into the soil, and he fashions out of the soil a character named Adam. And he lifts Adam, and he breathes life into Adam's nostrils. And he said, this is all yours. He said, but you've got to take care of it. You need to tend it. And so Adam began working, not work the way that we think of work, not, not toil, right? Not toil, but working the garden. But remember now, at the center of this garden, there's this tree, this tree of knowledge of good and evil, suggesting that outside of this space, outside of this garden, there exists things that Adam doesn't know anything about. So after a while, Adam asks the care of God for a companion. And he falls asleep, Adam does. And God comes in and plucks one of his ribs, and he creates Eve. And the two of them live happily in this garden, but not ever after. But one day they're out collecting food, and the serpent comes along, and he says to Eve and Adam, you all should eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And she says, no, we can't, because if we eat from that tree, God told us we will die. And the serpent says, no, 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 no. If you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God. So you should try it. And the rest, as they say, is history. Right? Well, banished from the garden, we've been wandering ever since. Our eyes have been opened. Now, what have we been wandering through? Well, down through the ages, you can see the different tools that we used. We can talk about going through stone and iron and now into our own hydrocarbon age, petroleum and plastics. How about our transportation, how we're able to move through time and space using these tools on foot, then moving from horse, train, automobile, airplane to space shuttle. And then from living in life in the country to life in the city to the suburbs and complaining about it, even though it's so nice, and then back to the space station. And now to moving to our life online, more and more of us every day. And then how we communicate, how we share these stories from things like smoke signals all the way up to those satellites that every now and then come back down through to wires and using wires and wireless. My point is, is that we are inextricably bound to our settings, to our spaces, and to our times. I use the word inextricable because, if you look, it's incapable of being disentangled, undone. If you remember in the book, at one point, I think it was when he's in Dresden, I know it's when he's in Dresden, he steps out and he gets caught in the wire, Billy Pilgrim does, and he can't disentangle himself. And then in very, very, very Vonnegut fashion, the Russian takes a leak off to the side. Uh, but we are inextricably bound. Because as we change our technologies, including story, you have to think of story as a tool. Our stories, as we change our technologies, including stories, as we change our technologies, excuse me, I'm a bit nervous. As we change our technologies, including story, our technologies change who we are and how we view ourselves and our settings. This photo was taken in 1967. The majority of you have been, were born after that, so you've always known this. But think about how this photo, coming down through the ages, the different technologies we've had, from maps that we drew in the dirt, from maps when we finally got them on paper, and then you'd have those interesting things like the sea creatures outside the bounds, not knowing what our landscape looked like, not knowing how we were traveling through it and moving through. But think about how this picture has changed things, how it has changed our perspective, how we view spaces, and times. If you think, okay, Eden's somewhere on there, right? And that's what we're told. But then we ate. And this here, 1967, this is, a, this is the God's eye view. Maybe. So, what the hell does all of this have to do with Vonnegut and Slaughterhouse Five? Now, Vonnegut, at the very beginning, or not, excuse me, not the beginning, towards the end of the book, he writes that there are almost no characters in the story and almost no dramatic confrontations because most of the people in it are so sick and so much the listless playthings of enormous forces. Pretty language. No characters, no subjects, no Jack. And no dramatic action, no confrontations. I don't know if that's entirely true, but maybe in the sense that we are usually expecting it from a story. But the people 
the people are so much the listless playthings of enormous forces. Who is the character? Who is the main character, the protagonist of this novel? Is it Billy Pilgrim? Is it, you know, look at that name in and of itself, a pilgrim, someone who is, who is bound to their faith, but yet also exerting their will, and, and, and forced to wander almost listlessly, this having or showing little or no interest in anything, being languid and spiritless. Well, I don't know that Billy's entirely spiritless. I mean, particularly after he comes home and he's very excited about telling everyone about his trips to Trafalmador. But what about Vonnegut? And what about Place? What about Place? Maybe Place is a character, the main focus, maybe the setting. It's important when we talk about people that we understand their context, of where they are from, so we know a little bit more about them, their spaces and their times. And we do the same thing with novels. For the sake of this, it's important to remember that Kurt Vonnegut, our subject, was born. Subject, and there's our verb. Where? In 1922, these prepositional phrases that give us increasing amounts of information. Do you see how wonderful language is, the elegance of it? how it can tie us into story, how it can tie us into time and place and different people's experiences, all the way down into here right now, today, and planet Earth. At least that's what we call it. Well, look at these events. These are a number of different events that occurred before Vonnegut's lifetime. He was born in 1922, and leading up to and finishing right here with the, the publication of Slaughterhouse-Five. Now, here's an individual Okay, think about, think about your own life and, and, and what happened, the major and minor historical events that happened before you were born and that will happen a little bit later. You can think about, I mean, do we have this? This is the 20th century. The 20th century, someone once described it as, 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 a, as a serious bloodletting. Uh, granted, people have always been dying and will continue to die, and that's a lot of dying, but that's an exceptional amount of dying. And Vonnegut witnessed or probably heard stories about it, I mean, before he was born. Look at that, 37 million dead in five years. And then on top of that, with all that fighting in the trenches, all that dirt and grime and, and disease spreading, you end up with an influenza, right? My fiance and I once came across a, 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 a postcard that had been written in 1920 and talking about the, you know, mom died. But it was very straightforward. The language is not exaggeration. It was, there was no hyperbole. It was very straightforward, a very different time. But look at this context. Look at the context in which he is living and the things, the, the number of people who are dying, and then that he is directly witnessing when he comes in, right, in his lifetime. But we also need to look carefully a little bit more closely at what was happening around where he was living. In the 1960s, and in particular writing the novel Slaughterhouse-Five, was the 1960s, and some of you may have heard it was a fairly tumultuous time as well, particularly here in the United States where we had a president assassinated, a civil rights leader assassinated. There were numerous riots in, in U.S. cities. I mean, not nearly the firestorms that happened in Dresden. That's not what I'm saying. But certainly you could fly over cities at night and see flames. You could see serious unrest. And then in 69 was when Vonnegut came and published the book. So that's, that's the context. That's, that's how this book came to be. That's, that's literally Vonnegut reaching into all these different things, shaping it and breathing life into it. That's how we do things. Now, how? Well, how does he deal with setting? And now, he talks, he, this is, gets back to Didion, what she was talking about earlier, this sort of the, 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 the figurative or the metaphorical. Now, when you read this, shells were bursting in the treetops with terrific bangs. Look, notice the use of the word terrific. That was terrific. Notice the root, tear, right? Do we still say that? Meh, right? I used to sit at the table and say this meal was terrible. And my father would yell, Dachau was terrible. Um, Anyhow, shells were bursting the treetops with terrific bangs, showering down knives and needles and razor blades. Now, did those things literally come showering down? No, but were they like that? I don't know, I wasn't there, but that's a hell of a description. But what about his use of the literal? He was 12 years old, quaking as he stood with his mother and father on Bright Angel Point, nice location, at the rim of the Grand Canyon. The little human family was staring at the floor of the canyon one mile straight down. Notice what a good job he does of having them be so young and looking into something so massive, such an incredible space that had been carved over serious amounts of time. Well, said Billy's father, manfully kicking a pebble into space, 
There it is. You see how this is different elements of the human condition that, that he's dealing with just on a paragraph by paragraph, a sentence by sentence basis that he's telling us. And this is a story within a story within several other stories within numerous spaces and times. And we can kind of follow, particularly if we use spark notes. But why? Why would Vonnegut, if you look at all those deaths that we talk about and all that carnage and, and mechanized warfare completely changing our understanding of warfare, why even try? Why would someone like Vonnegut sit in that place and spend hours and hours and hours and hours coming up with stories to tell folks like us? Well, one way to make sense of the world, you have numbers, you have other different symbols, but it's through art and literature, particularly when you have something like the Wolm, we put it in front of you. This is art. This is good art. And this is one of the ways that we make sense of the world, the way we make sense of our time in our space while listening to things that came before and thinking ahead. <coughs> Vonnegut published in 69, but the, world, the, war, the war, excuse me, ended in 45. It says, when I got home from the Second World War 23 years ago, I thought it would be easy to write about the destruction of Dresden. Now, for all of you who were here earlier in the semester, or excuse me, in, for, the, for Sal Diaz's talk on Monday, you saw some of those images. I haven't been including many of those images because I want you to focus a little bit more on some of these, uh, these words that he's using, but the images were tremendous, right? And here he is trying to make sense of them as they came out, piece by piece. They weren't all just available on the internet the way they are now. Easy to write about the destruction of Dresden, since all I would have to do would be able to report what I had seen. Makes it sound easy, right? And I thought, too, that it would be a masterpiece, or at least make me a lot of money since the subject was so big. And by so big, he's, he's being a bit flippant. He's, he's, he's talking about the human condition. Vonnegut felt strongly compared to share his thoughts with other humans, like you. That's why. But how was he going to do it? Now, we have a number of different methods for telling stories. We have stories that reassure us. We tend to call these genre fiction. And genre fiction conforms to the conventions of its genre. You watch a romance. Now, you combine romance and horror, and you get Twilight, right? You sit there, you watch these things, you expect certain things to happen, and then, yeah, they do. And you are satisfied because they have, this story has conformed to its genre. This is what we tend to read for fun. This is what we tend to read for school. Because these are the stories that challenge us. This is the art. Not to say that the other stuff's not art, that's not what I'm saying. But this stuff is equally as important. Now, literary fiction is what we call a book like this. It falls into that category because it is serious fiction. It's people that wear ties, that kind of stuff, right? It's usually critically acclaimed. Now, some of these stories, you're familiar with these. From 1984, it takes place in the future. Fahrenheit 451, also a future. For Whom the Bell Tolls, a war story. Catch-22, another war story. The Things They Carried, another war story. These stories are written primarily by men. Well, entirely by men, excuse me, right? But the war novel. The war novel becomes one of these it falls into the literary novel category. But more and more often, I think, Vonnegut saw it falling into the genre novel, that it was more and more for entertainment. If you remember earlier in the novel, Bernard's wife, Bernard O'Hare's wife, she's very upset, right? She's very upset with Vonnegut being in her house and, and because he wants to come and talk about Dresden. And she says, you're going to write a story and it's going to turn into a movie, and John Wayne and Frank Sinatra, movie stars, are going to play the parts, and you're going to send more little babies to war. Because, as she said, you know, and Vonnegut believed, as he writes in the book, that the stories probably cause war. And that's a very terrible paraphrase, and of course, I forgot to get my book out before I started. But there were also... a number of different reasons why Vonnegut was looking seriously at the war novel and looking at how all these other men had been writing the war novel and how he wanted to write in the war novel because he was maybe, I suspect, starting to believe that maybe the stories weren't helping us live or that they were relying on too many of these conventions, particularly in something like the war novel. So that he needed to find a new, a different, and a better way to go ahead and go about it. And in turn, he talks about the cockles of Billy's heart, at any rate, were glowing coals. 
What made them so hot was Billy's belief that he was going to convert so many people with the truth about time. But earlier in the book, he has that conversation with the famous person, the director, Harrison Starr, and he's, people always say, Harrison Starr says, well, you're writing an anti-war novel. And he says, well, yeah. And he says, you know what I tell people who are writing anti-war novels? You should be writing a novel about glaciers, right? Because he says, what, was there, what, what he meant, of course, was there would always be wars, that they were easy, as easy to stop as glaciers. I believe that too, Vonnegut says. And then, a little bit farther along, you say, I marked the wrong page. No. So, how to go about doing it? How to go about changing the war novel so it's no longer conforming to those particular conventions? And fortunately enough for Billy Pilgrim, he's in the hospital, and next to him is this character named Elliot Rosewater. And under, in a trunk underneath Elliot Rosewater's bed, there are a number of, of genre novels, these, these science fiction novels. And he's in the hospital, and Rosewater and Billy were dealing with similar crises this human condition, this sense of meaninglessness, in similar ways. They had both found life meaningless, partly because of what they had seen in war. So they were trying to reinvent themselves and their universe. Science fiction was a big help. Now, some of you who were here maybe earlier for Matt Murray's speech or talk, this is a great line, but there wasn't enough, these metaphors, they weren't enough anymore. But that isn't enough anymore, said Rosewater. Another time, Billy heard Rosewater say to a psychiatrist, I think you guys are going to have to come up with a lot of wonderful new lies. Now, I think Vonnegut thought of himself as something of a psychiatrist, and he was the one that was going to have to come up with these new lies. And I don't mean lie lies, I'm talking about fabrications, which, okay. But still, this is an important thing to consider. Particularly when we're moving on, and our understanding of space and time is changing, as we move along. So that the settings, if you have Eden on the, on the planet, it's an imaginary perfect place, and then we have that beautiful picture of the globe. You know, perfect, right? It, it isn't, it isn't. But now imagine what that view must look like from some place even farther away, moving farther away, using all those technologies that I've described earlier. Vonnegut's use of Tralfalmador as a setting for a literary novel was revolutionary for its time. Now, today we watch movies and they're set in outer space all the time. People travel through time all the time. We go through different dimensions, whatever. But no, his use, I mean, H.G. Wells had done things similar to this, but Vonnegut, when he went and did this into the war novel, when he started moving things to Trail Palmador, I mean, it was funny, and people didn't take it seriously for the most part. People were kind of a little bit of snobbery because it was science fiction, but it was in the war novel, and he was looking at it from a very different viewpoint than some of those other writers, those masculine writers writing about war, that I mentioned earlier. Again, why? That's a big reason, right? Money. And Vonnegut, right, one of the jokes Vonnegut made was that he was probably one of the only ones to profit from the bombing of Dresden. Did he do it for fame? Most certainly, right? Vonnegut was, had a great sense of humor and a great understanding of himself and place and time. That's a picture of the book when it came out, his first edition. But I believe this. I think that Vonnegut was aware that the frameworks available to the writers of literary fiction were no longer sufficient to the task of illuminating the human condition of what it had become during all that carnage of the 20th century. I think Vonnegut re realized this, and he tried to help. He tried to convey to us in the story what Joan Didion says, that stories help us survive. Now, I ask you, what do you think the settings of the future will be? Some of you may have heard of the novel Neuromancer. It was written by a guy named William Gibson. He was the one who coined the term cyberspace. You could think of maybe a movie, particularly a very famous movie, that takes place in cyberspace or someplace similar to it. But then there's this other one, this IQ 1984, which, excuse me, IQ 84, written by a Japanese writer named Luki Murakami. And that, book, people are, I haven't read it, but I've heard that people are constantly moving in and out of different dimensions. How do we do it in film? Because notice, I mean, these things, they're, they're going away, right? So we're spending more time to these because we're learning how to read things, not only words, but learning how to word, read images. We pay more attention to these now. This is where we get our story, but also this, next, this frontier. What about this? What about a massive 
multiplayer online game where you're just kind of going through it and then all of a sudden somebody who's playing in a completely different country comes through a dimension it's in your living room. Um, that happens. I want in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I, I, I think we have a few minutes. I tried to keep it short and sweet. Are there any questions? Good. Matt. Matt's asking if I could talk a little bit more about what I meant when I said place as a character. Um, in English 302, or excuse me, English 306, the class that I teach, we just finished reading Cannery Row. Uh, it's a novel that was written by John Steinbeck. It's a wonderful novel. It's very short. It's beautiful. And it's, it's, it's difficult to read. But in that book, it's similar to this in that there isn't a main character. There's not the usual protagonist that we can follow. And I mean, Billy Pilgrim is a flat character. He's not very dynamic. So the place itself is what the writing becomes about, the story. Are there any other questions? Yes? What was that beautiful um, spiral of the out there? Is it a galaxy? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Beautiful, right? Very elegant. I mean, you, we talk about the elegance of science, but elegance of language as well. Yes? Just one more thing about the setting as the character. Would you say that in, in novels, when that character becomes, or I mean, when the setting does become the character, it has to do with the magnitude of, of the setting and what's going on so much that the characters fall victim to what they're in the middle of? I don't know how to rephrase that into the mic. Um, yes and no. I think that it. it it depend, it, ultimately, it all depends on what the author's intentions are, in my opinion, what the author's going for. I don't know if that answers your question or not at all, does it? No. Sorry. Yes? Can you explain the end? Your subtitle? What, like, you know, I was very you had to text with our sons. I thought that someone might ask that. And I debated whether or not or how I was going to answer that. And I think it's a dirty trick not to answer it. But I think it's best to just to say I want our students to think about the future. And this might be something they might say. So you're saying what? Like, they're not in their own con technological context? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to pay attention to your setting when this is your setting. You know, when you're constantly staring down into that screen that's taking you into that completely different world. And that's what quite a few of our students do on a more than just a daily basis. Thank you all for coming today. I appreciate it. I just wanted to say thank you. And that was a really interesting idea, setting as a character, because I had noticed that the characters were kind of bland. But the writing was more vibrant, and so was his description of setting. And so I really like that you tied all that together. Good. Thank, thank you, you very much for coming. Yeah. Appreciate it. Hey, thank you. I'm glad thank I you. came. I'm glad I, you were here as well. Yeah, I, it was nice to watch you teach the other people. <laughs> now you've now you got to read the book. Yes, I do. And I'll see you tomorrow. Sounds thank good. you, Mike.